Good morning everyone and welcome to another episode of Nonstop Nick Hill. I just took the about 30 minute ferry from downtown Dakar to Ile de Gore, Gore Island. Now, Gore Island is not only one of the top tourist sites here in Dakar and in Senegal altogether, but it's also an extremely, extremely important site for Americans and US history. To be honest, without the atrocities and injustices and one might say crimes against humanity, which took place here on Gore Island between the 15th and 18th centuries, there would be no US. The US could not be what it is today. During this period between the 15th and 18th centuries, the whole range of European powers, be they the Portuguese, Dutch, French, British, they all used Gore Island as a processing area for slaves who were sent out across the Atlantic. Just as Ellis Island off the coast of New York City served as a processing plant for immigrants who were coming into the US from Europe, Gore Island was used as a processing plant for slaves who were enslaved by the Europeans from the African mainland, mainland to be processed here before they made their journey onward to Europe or the Americas. Some historians claim that Gore was one of the main processing plants with millions of enslaved peoples passing through this island. However, others say that it was a very minor site actually and dispute those numbers, but regardless, I mean, if anything of this sort happened here, which it definitely did, it represents the crimes against humanity committed by the Europeans during these hundreds of years. What I'm finding on my trip so far is you can definitely get small shots of, uh, of caffeine during the day from all these little stands that sell either in instant Nescafe or the local type of tea, which is very similar to the tea you get in Mauritania. But you can't just get like a big 16, 20 ounce, uh, four shot espresso drink like you can in the US. So I just had uh, a little tea there and I'm sure it'll be one of many teas today. Then I'll just like roam around the island. The main site here, the slave's house opens, reopens again in the afternoon. So I'll head there at 3 p.m. But I've got the whole day to spend here so it's not a problem. You saw all those tourists who joined me on the, on the ferry here, but it's actually pretty easy to find a quiet spot away from all of them uh, when you're on this island even though it's a pretty small island just try not to follow the groups but right now we're actually in front of one of the first standing mosques that remains here in Senegal and it's right behind me if you look at it it doesn't really look like a lot of the mosques that you see around the world it doesn't have like the, the, the typical arches and minarets and all of that however it's actually based off the architecture of uh, what a countryside church would look like in France and it dates back to 1892 but it's got this gorgeous location overlooking the ocean how about that now apart from just one or two sites there's not a lot you know, to like check off your list when you're on Gore Island but just wandering around it's quiet streets they're all beautifully painted you turn around a corner and you get a view of the ocean you can clearly imagine that one of the criticisms of this site is that though it's meant to be a very somber location a memorial to slavery on the west coast of africa and the atrocities committed by the europeans it can very easily turn into almost a disneyland kind of vibe when you have the the, the economic disparities between the tourists uh, who are from like the west and then the local people who see the tourists as a source of income which they need in their country in, in essence, it represents the realities of history joining with the realities of the present. It's really hard to, to kind of parse how you should feel about it. But then again, I'm here too, so I can't really say too much about that. Right now, I want to get away from the sunshine a bit before I head out for lunch. So I'm at the Ifan History Museum, and each of these rooms contains something different from a different part of the history of Senegal. Apart from just the sheer inhumanity and injustice of colonialization and slavery, one of the main reasons why this part of Africa mourns its history is that it was actually a region of empires. So the map behind me traces the territory, expansion, and migrations of the Ghana Empire, the Mali Empire, the Songhe Gao Empire, and various other 
city-states which existed in the area of West Africa. Maps like these show just how interconnected and complex relations were in these parts of the world before Europeans divided up the land, drew artificial borders, and disconnected the existing economies and communication path lines which existed around the world. As you can see, none of the colors here correspond to any current day national borders. The nation states that we have today are just artificial lines drawn by white people in Berlin or other cities in Europe with secret deals under the table. And it's the people today who have to live with their consequences. This display explains that pretty much up until the 16th century, it was only the Portuguese who would trade slaves uh, from brought from within Africa to the port of Lagos in current day Nigeria. And then they would be taken to the Iberian Peninsula or along um, the islands off the African coast, which were then owned by, Portuguese, uh, by the Portuguese and the Spanish. But after the 16th century, after the so-called discovery of the New World, that's really when the slave trade ramped up because there was a demand for people to cultivate the land in North, uh, in North America. And so at that point, it was when the other powers, the, the French, the Dutch, the British became involved in the trade of slaves from Africa to North America. Best estimates report that about nine and a half million slaves made the trip from Africa to North America as part of the transatlantic slave trade. So here on Gori Island, on the beach, you're gonna find a bunch of eateries and they all pretty much serve the same menu. When you're here in Senegal, you're probably gonna find a couple main dishes. So I figured I might as well give you a brief rundown of what they are. So you're gonna find yasa, which yasa is gonna be rice served with a meat and meat in a type of onion sauce. So I've had that before and if you know me, I don't like onions. So I just had the meat and rice. <laughs> So I did not order that again. And the other thing you're gonna find is mafe, which mafe is basically the same thing, meat, rice, but with um, a sauce made out of peanuts. So that's actually what I ordered today because I have not tried that one before. And then you'll find all the chebu, the chebu, which is gonna be spelled out T-I-B-T-H-I-E-B-O-U with the French spelling. So it's gonna have all the vowels in it. Um, but it's from, pronounced Chebu, so if you just say Chebu, and that's like the star of the, that's the star of the menu here. It's gonna be like rice that's flavored with hibiscus, which has a like sour leafy taste to it, um, with rice and then a meat. So you can get Chebu Jen, which is with fish and rice, or you can get Chebu Yapa, which um, I believe is lamb, and then there's probably another version with chicken in it, I'm not exactly sure. So that's another star and they usually mostly, most places we will usually especially serve that on Friday afternoons, but you'll find a couple places which uh, have that on the menu every day. That's actually really, really good. Oh, that's our food. Merci. To you, my food just came and so we have our muffet here. As I explained, we have our peanut sauce, our chicken, some rice. All looks really good, so I'm gonna give it a try uh, at 3 p.m. So we'll check that out. And then at 4.30, I see there is a ferry heading back to Dhaka. So I'll hopefully be able to grab that. But right now I'm gonna enjoy this meal. We just entered the Maison de Esclave, the house of uh, slaves here in, uh, in Gore Island. And you can see behind me, there's an explanation of the Triangle Atlantic trade. I'm sure you've read about it in social studies class in elementary school, but just a re as a refresher, it was basically how Europe became so rich. What they would do is they would get free labor from Africa, take them to the New World, to North America, use that free labor to uh, exploit the land in North America for its natural resources and agriculture, take those raw materials back to Europe where they would be fueled by the Industrial Revolution in Europe to actual manufactured goods which would then be exported again 
to North America and Africa and the rest of the world as exported goods, which they could easily make a profit of. So if you think about it, they're making profit from both ends. They're making profit from the finished goods, which are being sold to the rest of the world, and they're making profit from basically the free labor that they don't have to pay for. That's how Europe became rich. One point that the narrative at the museum tries to make is that it wasn't just those who were outright evil or the outright capitalists who really benefited from the profits of the slave trade, but rather it was even the regular people. It was the people who were buying consumer goods such as sugar or cotton or tobacco for their daily needs. It was everybody who was benefiting from the cheap prices which the labor of enslaved people brought to North America and Europe. And it wasn't just Europe that was complicit in the horrors of the slave trade, especially in the U.S., the places like Charleston, Providence, Rhode Island, were all major markets after enslaved people would be brought from the African continent to North America. Another important point that the narrative of this museum makes is that there is no such thing as just a slave, but there are enslaved people. It's people, in this case the Europeans and the Americans, who decide to undergo that very unnatural thing of owning another human and oppressing people to that degree. However, nobody themselves is naturally considered and born a slave or under that kind of mindset. So we need to acknowledge that those people were still people to begin with until it was the Europeans and Americans who intervened in their already existing life and their lifestyles uh, to enslave them. So we need to put the onus on those who did the enslaving rather than call it just calling those people slaves outright. And on that note of regular people benefiting off the backs of the enslaved people in North America, I mean, that's us too. It's not that just didn't end with the end of the slave trade um, or the abolition of slavery in the U.S in the mid-1800s, we're still benefiting from the benefits of all that free labor in the U.S. today. The exhibit notes that this wasn't the only slave house present on Gofe. Actually, all of the houses that were bordering the sea were used for that purpose. And it also makes note of the long-term consequences to the slave trade. The slave trade meant millions of people were displaced from the African continent, which also meant that this wasn't just a story of individuals, it was a story of families being separated, of societies being torn apart, of economies being destroyed, of ways of life being destroyed. And so at that point, when the slave trade had finished, Africa was already in shambles. It was uh, everything it had known and the empire and the wealth which it had concentrated prior to the arrival of Europeans was almost disbanded to the, to the point that it just became easy for Europeans to then almost apply salt to the wound and then say, hey, we're going to draw lines where lines never existed um, and to our advantage, uh, take control of the area now that you're weak. And it was, um, I, I probably wasn't uh, in, in consciously strategized that way, but over the course of 100 years, that's how it played out. And it's pretty appropriate that the house opens up right onto the ocean. You have the Atlantic Ocean behind me, and pretty much the enslaved people would be leaving from this house, from the port, for on a ship under terrible conditions and they probably had no idea where they were going. But right across the other side of this ocean would be North America. And so the presence of this museum right on the ocean almost acts as a memorial to all those enslaved people who didn't even make it to North America. Probably the thousands, if not millions of them who died on routes to North America in the ocean. This is in their memory. And it's not just uh, people from around the African continent visiting the site. There are people from all over the African diaspora. I've seen uh, black Americans here, black British uh, people here, and uh, I've just seen people in tears, getting to physically feel what they know that their ancestors have gone through, leaving the African continent against their will,
just to fulfill some sort of capitalist, imperialist fantasy. And what makes it real is being able to see the shackles. Those heavy, heavy shackles are on display at this museum. Shackles not just for the feet and hands, but shackles that go around their necks. It's unthinkable. Another point that becomes very, very clear here is just the hypocrisy of Europe. Europe only decides to legally abolish anything once they've completely profited off of it. I mean, it's the U.S. as well. Uh, I guess I mean just uh, Europe and the and uh, and North America, all the imperialist lands. I guess Australia is involved in that too. But it's not like there was any one point when the Europeans decided that hey, you know, enslaving people is wrong. Even France, uh, one moment. Uh, abolish slavery and then decide, oh wait, we can't, uh, we can't sustain ourselves without free labor. We're going to enact slavery again. And then it was only until much later in the 19th century that they actually decided to completely abolish it. Um, and so if you think about things like slavery and then currently you think about climate change, it's, it's only that the Western world is deciding that they want to limit carbon emissions after they've already polluted and destroyed the world. And it's it's, it's much of the, the poorer countries that are really facing its consequences right now. A visit to the Maison des Esclaves reminds us that slavery is not just a thing of the past. It exists today. Actually, there are probably more people living in enslavement or conditions close to enslavement today than there are at any point in human history. And moreover, more than 70% of those people are women and children. And so we can all play a part to ensure that the mo world's most vulnerable people live in good conditions, have freedom and autonomy over their bodies and self, and that we never repeat the mistakes of the world's past. Now I know all of that was very somber, <laughs> but there's no other way about it, but I just left La Maison des Esclaves, and I'm here on, back on the beach. Uh, it's about 4 p.m. and the next ferry back to Dakar leaves at 4.30. So maybe I'll grab a seat somewhere, get a tea or get a coffee. Um, just decompress a bit. It's been a long, but very eye-opening day. And I'll leave you with this little heart. Because <laughs> what, else, what else can be more positive uh, at this moment? Hi, I met Ahmed on the ferry. Uh, he actually from at the Maison de Esclaves. Maison de Esclaves. Yeah, we've been uh, talking a lot, and he's uh, from Abidjan. And he's been actually traveling all over West Africa. So we had a great chat at the port in Gorre, and then on the on the ferry back over. He's here with his mom. And he knows everything about West Africa. Yeah, and the <laughs> big cheese for your mom, your father, and your friend always. Oh yeah, he's a great guy. <laughs> Thank you. Did you speak? No. Did you speak? Thank you, madam. Bon voyage. Merci. Bon voyage. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Dakar. Back at Place de l'Independence here in downtown Dhaka. Uh, right when I got back, I had my leftover chebu jin from last night. So I'm not hungry, but I don't know. There's pretty much everything right here. And you can't say that in a lot of cities. It's pretty cosmopolitan. There are people from all over the world. Huge Lebanese community. I don't know if that's just this neighborhood or all around Dhaka. Um, so I'm sure there's like some good uh, Lebanese food here as well. But with that, I think I'll end this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got to see a little bit of a really dark moment in history for all of our continents, for North America, for Europe, for Africa, between the 15th and 18th centuries. And more importantly, that you see the parallels and influence that this period of time has on our current state of the world and current affairs. But with that, I will end the episode. Good night. Oh,